today I've got a nice sum problem that comes from a 1968 submitted problem to the American Mathematical Monthly. So if you want to look it up, it's problem number E2079. So let's see what we've got here. So for all n bigger than or equal to 2, we want to determine the following sum. So it's the sum over all ordered pairs p and q from a set called a sub n of 1 over p times q. You might say, well, what is that set a sub n? Well, it's defined as follows. So it's all ordered pairs p, q, such that 1 is less than or equal to p, which is strictly less than q, which is less than or equal to n. So that's our first condition. The second condition is that p plus q is bigger than n. And finally, the third condition is the GCD of p and q is equal to 1. So in other words, they're relatively prime. Okay, so in order to get an idea of what's going on here, so we can potentially see a pattern in these sums, we should probably do some examples. And so let's start with the smallest possible example, which is the case when n is equal to 2. So for each of these examples, really the hard part is to find the set a sub n, and then after that we just compute the sum. So let's notice that a sub 2 is the following set of ordered pairs, or maybe I should say ordered pair, and it's the ordered pair 1, 2. I think it's pretty clear that that's the only ordered pair that satisfies this rule here. So, well, note that that means that our sum is, well, it's a sum of exactly one term and we'll get one half. Let's maybe call this s sub 1. And then let's introduce that notation over here. So let's call this sum s sub n. Okay, so now, or I guess I should have called this thing s sub 2 because we're starting at n equals 2. Okay, now let's move on to the next smallest case, which is pretty clearly the case when n is equal to three. So let's calculate our set first. So our set a sub three, well, it'll have one comma three in it, and then it'll also have two comma three. But that's really all that we can have. Notice it can't have one comma two because one plus two is equal to three, which is not bigger than three. And then it can't have two, two, because two and two aren't relatively prime to each other. Okay, so these are the only two elements of this set. And so that means S sub three is one over three plus one over two times three, given our rule over here, which is one over six, but those add together to give us one half. So, Let's notice that the first two possible sums here are both equal to one half. Now that should raise some suspicions. And generally, when one of these problems is given, the pattern you know, shows itself pretty quickly. So perhaps the sum is always equal to a half. But let's look at a couple of more examples first. So let's look at the case when n is equal to 4. And actually, we're going to look at maybe more examples than we need to because not only do we need to get a guess on what the sum is, but we need to get a guess on how to determine this sum. So let's look at a sub 4. So that's going to have 1 comma 4. It'll have 2 comma 3. And it'll also have 3 comma 4. But that's all we'll get in there. Okay, well, let's calculate A or S sub 4 in this case. So this will be a quarter plus a sixth plus a twelfth. But if you add that up, you also get one half. Okay, so I think it's a pretty good guess that this sum is always equal to a half at this point. That being said, let's do a couple of more examples, maybe not to calculate the sum, but to get an idea of what this set a sub n looks like. Okay, so let's maybe do the n equals 5, the n equals 6, and the n equals 7 cases. I think that'll maybe 
give us enough examples so that we have a feel for what these A sub N sets are. And, you know, I'm not going to write out the sum for each of them. I'll let you check that in each of these cases, the sum is also equal to a half. So A sub 5 will get 1 comma 5. Note that we don't have 2 comma 3 in this case because 2 plus 3 is 5. That's not bigger than 5, which is, again, one of our conditions over here. That being said, we will have two comma five, we will have three comma four because those are relatively prime and they sum to seven, which is bigger than five. And then we'll have three comma five and we'll also have four comma five. Okay, so those are the elements of A5. And then the elements of A6 are gonna be one, six, 2, 5. Note that we can't have 2, 6 because those are not relatively prime. Uh, we can have 3, 4 because those add up to 7, which is bigger than 6. We can have 3, 5. That's okay. We can have 4, 5. We're not allowed to have 4, 6 because those are not relatively prime, but we can have 5, 6. Okay, great. And then let's maybe skip this n equals 7 case and really like zoom in on what we're really interested in looking at. And that is what's different about two consecutive sets here. That'll give us a clear path to finding this sum. So let's look at what's inside of A6, but not inside of A5. So we write that as like the subtraction or the set subtraction, the set difference of A6 and A5. So again, those are the elements of A6 that are not in A5. Okay, so note that one comma six is gonna be inside of A6, but not A5, and then what else? Well, so these two are shared, these two are shared, these two are shared, these two are shared, and then five comma six. Okay, great. And then, well, let's look at what's inside of A5, but not inside of A6. Well, note that we'll have one comma five, because that's different. And then, well, that's it actually. So there we have what's inside of A6, but not A5, and what's inside of A5, but not A6. But let's notice that everything that's inside of A6, which is not inside of A5, ends in a six. And you can check that this is always the case. Notice everything inside of A5, which is not inside of A4, ends in a five. So that is in A5, but not A4, it ends in a five. That is two, that is two, that is two. So those all end in fives. Okay, so that's important to notice that if something's in A n, for instance, but not in A n minus one, it will end in an n, or at least it seems like it will. And then what about this? So now we've got everything in A5, which is not in A6, and that ends in a five. But that's actually not important here. What's important here is that the sum here is equal to six. And since the sum here is equal to six, well then we're not allowed to be in A6, but we would be allowed to be in A5. Again, by this condition over here, which is actually you know, quite useful. Okay, so looking at these and seeing the structure of what's in one set but not in another, I think we've got a good way to guess the structure of these set differences maybe in general. So let's do that. Okay, so let's introduce some notation. Let's say that B sub n is the set difference of A sub n with A sub n minus one. So in other words, it's elements inside of A sub n, but not in A n minus one. And then C sub n will be the opposite difference. So it's elements in A n minus one, which are not in A n. And now we're gonna make the following claim, which we'll really just talk through. I don't think it requires writing down the proof. So B sub n is equal to all ordered pairs of the order P comma n, where P is between one and n and the GCD of P with n is equal to one. 
Okay, so notice that these ordered pairs satisfy the rules to be inside of A sub n. So that means B sub n is most definitely a subset of A sub n. But then let's also notice that the ordered pair includes an n, but since it includes an n, which is larger than a n minus one, every element here is not inside of a n minus one. So that gives us the inclusion that b sub n is contained inside of here, and then the opposite containment is like fairly similar. Okay, so now let's look at c sub n. So note that all of these things satisfy the rules of being inside of a n minus one. And that's because notice that p has got to be bigger than one. But then also they don't satisfy the rules of being inside of a n because the sum here is equal to n, but the sum being equal to n means it's too small to be inside of a n by this condition over here. Okay, so if you're interested, you could write down maybe a careful proof, but I think maybe talking through that, that's like fine. Now let's prove the main result, which is that our sum is always equal to a half. So let's call this the green claim versus the peach colored claim here. And so we have S sub N is equal to a half for all N bigger than or equal to two you know, like we said over here. Okay, how are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna look at the difference between two of these consecutive sums. So let's look at S sub N minus S sub N minus one. Okay, but let's note that that's gonna be equal to the sum as P and Q go from a n of one over P times Q minus the sum as P and Q go from a n minus one of one over P times Q, just by definition of these things. But then by the way we've constructed these sets, notice that that's equal to the sum as P and Q go from B n of one over P times Q minus the sum as P and Q go from C n of one over P times Q. Again, that's by the way that we define these sets because of the stuff that cancels out. But now we can rewrite these as follows. So this first one can be written using maybe this parameterization of the elements of Bn as the sum as P goes from one to N minus one of one over N times P. Well, where we've got this GCD condition as well, but I won't write the GCD condition in there. Let's just say that that GCD condition is understood. And then, well, we can similarly parameterize the elements of Cn, but we've got to be careful with this condition right here. So this condition that Pn is less than n is required so that the second entry is larger than the first entry, which is our first condition over here. But notice that this can be rewritten as P is less than or equal to the floor of n over two. Okay, so that means that we can in fact write this as the sum as P goes from one to the floor of N over two of one over, well now we've got P times N minus P. So something like that. But next up, we're gonna take this first sum and split it into two pieces. And those two pieces will be like the bottom half and then the top half. So this will be the sum as P goes from one to the floor of N over two of one over N times P plus the sum as P goes from the floor of N over two plus one up to N minus one of one over N times P. Okay. And then maybe before we move on to a cleaner chalkboard, let's notice that we can re-index this 
by replacing, let's see, p with n minus p, and that'll turn this into the sum as p goes from one to the floor of n over two of one over, so n times n minus p. Again, by re-indexing. So let's see. That means that we have our difference in our sums, Sn minus Sn minus one, will be this sum which I'm circling in orange, plus this sum which I'm circling in orange, which is an artifact of the top half being re-indexed, minus this sum which I'm circling in orange, which we haven't really worked with yet. And then let's notice that those all have the same bounds of summation. So that means we can push them together into one sum. So let's do that. Okay, so this is where we ended up on the last board where this sum, well, it's understood to be only adding over the values of P that are relatively prime to N. That's important to point out. Okay, so now it's just a matter of pushing these fractions together and seeing what we get. So notice that our common denominator will be n times p times n minus p. So that means I need to build each of these up a little bit. So we're gonna build this one up by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by n minus p. And then we'll uh, build this one up by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by p. And then finally, we'll build this last one up by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by n. But now all the denominators are the same so that we can just add straight across the numerators. So we have n minus p plus p minus n. But notice that that means everything cancels down to zero because we have n minus n and minus p plus p. So there we have it. The difference in Sn and Sn minus one is zero. But that means that all of these numbers, Sn, have the same value. But then while we were exploring, we saw that the first couple had the value of a half, but that means all of them have the value of a half. And so that finishes proving that in fact, all of these have the value of a half. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.